Revelation chapter 2. It is springs too early this year. That's what I think. I do. I think springs too early. Spring ought to wait till at least April. At least. Because you know the quicker it gets here, the quicker everybody starts sneezing, eyes burning, all that hay fever, allergies, and everything else kicks in and Boy, I definitely don't like that. Uh, Revelation chapter 2. A um, couple, more, couple more verses I want to touch on in um, relation to Christ commending this church for being faithful unto the end, even in the midst of the martyrdom of Antipas. By the way, who was the first martyr? Stephen was. He was the first person martyred. What famous person was there when he was being martyred? Paul was. He didn't actually throw stones at Peter. We don't think he held the coats of everybody that was throwing stones at Peter. But Paul or Saul was consenting unto his death. And then later, God turned Paul around and he saw the light and now he's one of them. And now Paul has uh, become a martyr himself for the Lord Jesus Christ, having his head removed from him by Caesar. Uh, but anyway, uh, Antipas is a martyr here. And we were talking about being faithful unto the end. And there's always a question about if someone, if someone comes, they, let's say they come to the altar, they ask to be saved and they come to church for a while and then they get out. Um, were they saved? Did they lose their salvation? Uh, and some, there's some who would say they're going to heaven anyway. There's some who would say they lose their salvation. Um, but here's what I think the Bible best refers to them as. I call them temporary believers because some people are that way. They are temporary believers. In James 1.25, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and he's talking about the New Testament, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And speaking of James, and I don't know what was making me think of this, but I was doing some things the other day and I thought about where James talked about um, faith without works is dead. Some use that to say, see, you are saved by works. But I, I agree with you, Sister Betty. No, no, no. You're not saved by works. So I, I don't believe in replacing words in the Bible, but it is my job to sort of help you understand. So I would say it like faith without evidence is dead. Because that's the works. The works that you do after you're saved is what God does in you and you can have all kinds of people. You can go knock on every door in this town, ask them if they're a Christian. A lot of them would say yes, but is there any evidence that they're Christian? Is there any evidence that they're saved? Is there a changed life? Does the fruit of the Spirit abide in their life? Jesus said you shall know them by their fruits. And so that's kind of how I see that faith and works issue is that it would be like, um, oh, I don't know who built the Titanic. But the guy builds the Titanic and he claims not even God can sink this ship. Well, are you going to ride on it? Who, me? Are you crazy? I ain't riding on that thing. 
Did he really believe it was unsinkable? No, he just said that for whatever reason. And that's what you have. You have some people who say they're Christian. They want to say that, but they have absolutely no evidence in their life whatsoever that they are. And that's kind of how I see that there. Uh, then 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. This, to me, uh, sort of clenches it. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Paul called them false brethren. There's false prophets, false gospels, false Jesus, false Bibles, and false brethren. And he said, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. In other words, if they were really who they said they were, the evidence would have been there. The continuing of their faith would have been there. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. They were false brethren, temporary believers. They left Egypt, never made it into the promised land. So 1 John chapter 2, and you might want to turn there because you probably can't read it up on the screen. Uh, for a dollar, you can. <laughs> well, that when a person gets saved, and the first day, they're not going to have, have a proof because they don't know the word. Well, do you, do you know, you yeah, I do. I, th I think I get that. The, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, Faith, meekness, kindness. I always forget one of them. I guess since there is no law, it's Galatians chapter 5. So it lists the nine fruits of the Spirit there. But obviously at some point, their life will either manifest fruit or their life will manifest corrupt fruit or no fruit. And then you'll know. And that, with me, that issue was settled when I was, I, God had me study the parable of the seed and the sower. Because I looked at those four groups and I went, obviously three of these groups do not go to heaven and at least two of them were in church at one point. But because of either the stony ground or the thorns choking out the word, they produce no fruit unto, and, and in one gospel it says fruit, fruit unto perfection. So it, it nails it down there that they never did produce or manifest the fruit of perfection. When you, when you link that with John 15, I'm the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, the same shall bring forth much fruit. But if you don't bring forth any fruit, my father will cut you off and cast you into the fire and you shall burn up. Then that links over with Hebrews chapter 6, where it talks about um, they that were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, if they shall fall away, it is impossible for them um, to be renewed, seeing they crucified of themselves the Son of God afresh. And right after that, he talks about um, how the herbs of the earth are brought forth by rains that come down. Rain is doctrine. Uh, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and nigh unto curse and, and is to be burnt. So to me, those all, all of those go together to show whether or not somebody actually did go to heaven or not. And again, all of that is for you and God to work out. A church never says you're saved, you're not saved. No church ever has the right to say that. 
Because it's not our place to judge somebody. Just because we put somebody on the membership rolls does not mean that we, that we know for a fact they're saved. Or just because we take somebody off the membership rolls does not mean that they lose their salvation. But it does in some churches. You can, when you are excommunicated from certain churches, you, according to them, you're not going to heaven. No ifs, ands, or buts. First John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children. It is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists. Just go to Hollywood. They're everywhere. Whereby we know that it is the last time. Notice this, they went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, we read that earlier, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One. Now he's talking to us who are truly saved. We have an unction from the Holy One. And ye know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth. But because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and Son. And again, I have heard, I have read their statements on Facebook saying that they believe somebody can be saved for 15 minutes and then basically become an Antichrist and deny Jesus and God and they still go to heaven. That is not true. Um... Verse 22, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. And he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So you're allowing that which God begun in you to remain in you. You don't want God to stop working in your life. You don't want God to stop chastening you as a, as a loving father would. You don't want God to walk away from you. You don't want God to stop correcting you. You don't want God to stop forgiving you. You want God to keep doing that which he swore he would do. And that's the difference between those who are truly saved and those who are not. Um, Sister Linda to me, her testimony. The last conversation I had with her was, I'm still waiting to get better enough so I can come to church and stand and tell my church what God has done for my life. She didn't make it. But I'll stand and I'll tell, testify for her what God did in her life. She remained faithful unto the very end. And I did not have a problem in the world telling everybody she was saved. Um, back in Revelation 2, and while you're turning there, that... I've told this story so many times, but it, it's about my brother-in-law who I saw the change in him there toward the last part of his life. I could see it as he came to me and he said, how will I know I'm going to heaven? I said, Steve, you are. And I said, Steve, you know me well enough to know that I wouldn't tell you you're going to heaven if you weren't. I'd tell you the truth. Because he's wanted to hit me a few times for telling him such a truth. And he would have done it too. The most scared I've ever been was he and I and Sterling were working in a house one time. And Steve was just in a foul mood. And from all the way across that house, he hollered something at me and I yelled back at him and I heard. And I'm going, oh, no. And he was, he told me, he got right up to me. 
And he kind of gave me a chewing out in a Steve Leonard way. He told me later, he said, I was going to hit you. I was going to tear your head off. But I saw your glasses and I didn't, for some reason, I didn't want to break your glasses. <laughs> Thank God for glasses. But I knew he, I just knew he was going to deck me. I knew he was. But that Sunday he came and asked me that question. And I could already see the difference in his life. I prayed with him. And from that Sunday to that Friday, he didn't get worse in sin. He got better in faith. Because his son Josh came to the house. And he said, Dad was different this week. Dad, I'd walk in the house, Dad would be sitting there reading his Bible. Dad would take me and saying, Son, you need to know Jesus. You need to, before you die, you need to know you got Jesus in your heart. That's saved. That's saved. And um, there's evidence. It's like, it's like Brady and Bradley's dad. Having been saved three days, knows more about theology than his sons knew. And they had studied it all their life. Because he said, boys, I just feel like I got somebody living inside of me. And he knew it. <laughs> and I, I did. I laughed. As soon as Brady told me that, I laughed. I said, you guys have been reading the Bible for years. And he got that in three days. <laughs> Amen. All right. Change the subject. Revelation 2.14. But. And this could be any church. This, this, this could be our church. It could be anybody's church. There's churches. They will do some things well. Some things they won't do well. And he said, I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, what is the doctrine of Balaam? Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So that's two churches now. The earlier one held the deeds of the Nicolaitans. This church holds the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And we'll go back over what that is. But what is the doctrine of Balaam? Does anybody know? Anybody want to take a guess at it? The doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Uh, if you turn to 2 Peter. Turn there. Peter mentions it. Jude mentions it. And here's what's interesting. This is why I tell you. Don't expect to get all your doctrine from one spot in the Bible. If you're really wanting to know something, search the scriptures. Go around them. Go, go here a little, there a little. Line upon line, precept upon precept, the way Isaiah said. Paul said it this way. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. In other words, the Holy Ghost is going to show you something out of the Old Testament. Then he's going to show you something out of the New Testament. Now, if you go to Numbers and you read the story of Balaam, it kind of looks like Balaam is trying to do the right thing. But it becomes apparent when you read what Jesus said, here in Revelation 2, what Peter said and what Jude said, it becomes very apparent that he wasn't doing the right thing. So this is why you've got to have the whole Bible telling you the truth about everything. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery. This is, this is some, some pastors, some preachers. We have preachers, evangelists, 
people in music ministry that are falling away by the hundreds, by the thousands every week because of the sins related to adultery and fornication. It is everywhere where pastors are being caught up having had multiple affairs, having been addicted to internet things, having lascivious minds, lascivious hearts, eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin. And because of that, that will always change their doctrine. Will always change their doctrine. It's that crowd that starts becoming soft on sin. Then they become forbearing of sin. And then they preach the practicing of sin as if it's okay. There is, and I did not know about this. One of my uh, pastor friends asked me if I'd heard about it and I said no and he said my son's gotten into it big time they call it extreme grace that says it's perfectly okay for you to go out and do whatever the stink you want because God will have such grace on you that he will excuse you no matter what and he said my son is in the ministry and he believes this and he said, he started drinking. He said, there's no telling what else he's doing. And I'm going, are you kidding? Because I knew, I knew he was talking about. I said, he's doing that? Yeah. But that's what they've gotten into. They call it extreme grace. And that God just forbears and lets you do whatever you want to do with no consequences whatsoever. And I'm going, that is not, that's not the Bible. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. That means they're not saved, period. They are not saved. You cannot be blessed with salvation and cursed at the same time. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, and here it is now, who loves the wages of unrighteousness. So what was the sin of Balaam the prophet? He did what he did for the money. Do you remember Elisha the prophet after Elijah? And Naaman... The captain of the, of, um, I forgot what army he was from, but Naaman comes to Elisha with all these gifts and he's going to ask of Elisha, you know, what can you bless me because Naaman had leprosy. And he comes bringing all these gifts and Elisha's um, servant, Gehazi, Elisha tells Gehazi, Gehazi says, Elisha, uh, Naaman's here and he wants to see you. And Elisha knew what was up. He knew that he wanted to flatter Elisha, bow before him, make some kind of big deal about him, say great words about him, offer him all these gifts. And Elisha just sat in the tent and he said, I'm not going out there. Gehazi, go tell him, I know what he wants. He wants to be cleansed of leprosy. Go out and tell him to dip in the river Jordan seven times and he'll be healed. So Gehazi goes out and Naaman says, where's your boss? Well, he's not coming out. And that made Naaman mad. Well, I have all these gifts. Well, we won't take any of them. Just go and dip in the river Jordan seven times. What well, made Naaman mad, of course, he thought it'd be some big show, you know, like on TV, big healing show. And it wasn't that way. And his servant told him, you know, if he had, if he had told you to do anything, even if it cost a million dollars, wouldn't you do it? And he said, yeah. Then why don't you go dip in the river Jordan seven times? 
So he went and did that and got healed. Meanwhile, Gehazi, what does he do? He goes chasing down Naaman and he says, uh, my boss changed his mind. He doesn't want to offend you. So if you'll give me the gifts, I'll take those to Elisha the prophet because he didn't want to embarrass you or something like that. So Naaman gave him all the gifts. But did Elisha tell Gehazi to do that? No. And, and what happened to Gehazi? He ended up with the leprosy that Naaman had on him. Okay? Elisha knew that Naaman want, thought that he could buy the grace of of God and Elisha was teaching him the grace of God is never bought and paid for it's always a gift always amen but that's what Balaam that's what's in his mind is what can I get out of this so the way that following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass, which is the his donkey is ass speaking to him with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Jude one eleven says, woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. So now twice now, the Bible's telling us something that we, if you turn to, turn to the book of Numbers 22. In Numbers, you never, it, I've read this several times. And it always kind of befuddled me because it always looks like that uh, Balaam is turning down the gifts. But apparently, he's doing it, he's acting like he's turning it down, wink, 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 but I'll take it anyway. So Numbers 22, 5, he sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure, I shall prevail that we may smite them and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed and he whom thou cursest is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. Who remembers these 900 numbers? I don't know if they're still around. You call 1-900 so-and-so and what was that? Huh? You got charged for that. Big time. So you called Princess Cleo, the astrologer. And it wasn't really Princess Cleo. It was some other gal that you got on the phone. And their job was to keep you on the phone as long as possible. There used to be, um, years ago in towns across America, there used to be laws against fortune telling. But now it's sort of become a more accepted practice. But they do regulate, but there's ways around it. They do regulate fortune telling, but there's ways around it. Because no fortune teller will ever, ever do anything for you unless you pay them. Never. And in some cases... It's like some doctors. The more they can get you to coming back to them, they say, well, it's going to take at least 20 visits now. We got to work you, we got to work you over. We got to do this. We got to do that and rack up all those bills. They won't do them for free. 
And they keep charging you and charging you and charging and that's the way it is. Well, has that not also crept into Christianity? You watch TBN and watch any of those shows on, that are on TBN. At the end of the show, they have a book offer or a DVD offer, a teaching offer of some kind. You need this vital teaching. You need this. This, this will change your life. This will make your life so much better. God has given brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, these amazing teachings, and they can be yours for your, and here's what they say, love offering, love gift of $49.95 plus $20 postage and handling. Okay? Now, and I've actually had people do this. I've, I've asked people, Watch some of these shows, call that number and tell them, you don't have any money, can you have the book for free? And they've all written back to me and said, we didn't get nothing. We didn't get nothing. And you can't. Um, who was it? Perry Stone. Perry Stone does the prophecy thing on TBN. He had his lawyers write up, Perry Stone sends out this news magazine. He had his lawyers write up a big full page thing in his prophecy news magazine. Basically saying, we are sick and tired of you people getting Perry Stone's teachings and putting them on YouTube. Because you're robbing Perry's ministry of vitally needed funds. So we're demanding that you no longer put Perry Stone's videos on your YouTube channel. And the way YouTube is now, if you put it up there, uh, YouTube may take it down or they may put a bunch of advertisements in it to pay Perry Stone because it's his teaching to begin with. And I've had people call me before, can, can I put Pastor Mike's videos on my YouTube channel? Do it! In fact, I, what, what took you so long? I want you to put my videos on your YouTube channel. Cause I don't know how that, some people have a YouTube channel, they put my videos on there, and on their channel, my videos get twice the viewings as they do on my channel. So like, how can I lose in this deal? I don't. Because number one, I don't charge anything for them ever. I don't monetize the videos. So YouTube doesn't pay me for the ad revenue. So I don't get anything from putting them out there. I get nothing from sending them all over the place. And I knew people were making copies of videos. And I tell people, make copies of the videos. Pam Kettleson. The first time I ever heard of her was she sent us a letter with pictures. They had used to have some kind of festival up there, fall festival up there in Wisconsin. And her and Keith and some other people put up a booth and all it was was my videos at the booth and they were giving them away to everybody at that thing. And I went, I'll be! And then they ended up moving down here. But that's what that is. The stumbling block that uh, when Jesus was dealing with this church, apparently... Somebody was doing something in that church and wanting and demanding to be paid for it, demanding money for it or some sort of remuneration or some sort of payback of some kind. That's what they were doing. And that's that's just part of it. And we'll get into the rest of it next Sunday. Father, we ask your blessings on your word and we thank you for it. Father, freely you have given to us. Help us, dear God, to freely give to others such as what we have. Father, we pray, Lord, that you'd bless the gospel as it's preached this morning. Pray, dear God, that you would save lives, save souls. Bless the feeding this week. Bless those in Kenya. Bless, Father, those who are hungry around the world for the word of God. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would feed them. And help them to understand, God, that grace, that true grace... It's always free. 
Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.